Hello everyone, this is Eye on Africa for Thursday, September 29th. Here are the headlines. One of the men accused of funding and supporting the Rwandan genocide stands trial in The Hague. Prosecutors say Félicien Kabouga played a crucial role in the event. 800,000 people were killed over just three months in 1994. Cyril Ramaphosa says there was no money laundering and no cover-up, but an independent investigation will now have to determine whether the South African president should face possible impeachment over hundreds of thousands of dollars stolen from his farm two years ago. And in the annual Global Innovation Index, some of the world's overperformers are located in Africa. We'll have more on what that means with our guest, one of the lead authors of the report. He's one of the last alleged masterminds of the Rwandan genocide to go to trial. Prosecutors say Félicien Kabuga played a crucial role in the 1994 genocide as his trial opened in The Hague this Thursday. At the time, he was one of Rwanda's richest men and set up a hate radio station that urged ethnic Hutus to kill Tutsis. He's also believed to have armed militias with machetes. More than 800,000 people were killed over the course of just three months. Clément Dioma has this report. Epaphrodite Nyenigondo survived the Tutsi genocide. In 1994, his two brothers were murdered in this district of the Rwandan capital. They were killing people here where I'm standing. There were corpses everywhere and they were thrown into the gutter here or on a mass grave there. The inhabitants of the Muhima neighborhood still live in the shadow of this building, built by Felicien Kabuga, a once wealthy businessman accused by the international justice of financing the massacres. Epaphrodite lived near the building at the time. He escaped the Hutu militias who massacred Tutsis. After the genocide, he joined Ibuka, an organization of survivors supported by the government. He remembers the comings and goings of the militiamen. That building over there was the house of Felicien Kabuga. It hosted a base of the former ruling party, the MRND. The neighborhood's militiamen came to take their weapons here. They came from the north of the country. They came out of the house when they were ordered to go and kill. After more than 20 years on the run, Felicien Kabuga was arrested in France in 2020. A specialized court also accuses him of financing Radio des Mille Collines, a station encouraging the massacres. Il y avait there were a lot of messages saying that the Tutsis are enemies of the country, that you have to kill them. That's how a lot of extremists were convinced that they had to kill. For his responsibilities within the extremist media, Kabuga will be tried for incitement to commit genocide. Randa issued more than 40 international arrest warrants against suspected genocide perpetrators living in France. They are still pending, according to the Rwandan authorities, for whom the trial of Felicien Kabuga is an urgent matter. Time passes and people get older. Organizers died and we didn't hear about it until 10 or 15 years afterwards. And they never went to court. This is bad for the history of the country and for the victims. But Kabuga already pled not guilty. His lawyers have called for the prosecution to be discontinued due to his poor health. Well, you just saw that report from our very own Clément Di Roma. He is in Rwanda, where for many survivors of the genocide, the trial has been a long time coming. He has more now from Kigali as the first day of the trial draws to a close. We will provide proof of his crimes. These are the words of the prosecutor during the opening statement of uh, Felicien Kabuga's trial. It's just a few words, but they resonate here in Kigali, the capital, where the accused lived after his 30th birthday. Uh, the representative of the survivors were awaiting new revelations about the, the two decades Kabuga spent uh, on the run, say they are disappointed by uh, Kabuga's refusal to attend the opening of his trial. But they welcome the words used by the prosecution on uh, the first day. For the prosecutor, Kabuga played a central role in inciting hatred of Tutsis and in paving the way for genocide. Uh, he claims, uh, amongst other things, that the businessmen financed and armed extremist militias responsible for the massacres uh, against the Tutsis. Opening statements will continue tomorrow and the presentation of the first evidence will begin on October 5th in the Netherlands. An independent investigation will determine whether South African President Cyril Ramaphosa should face possible impeachment. Two years ago, hundreds of thousands of dollars were stolen from his game farm, which has led to accusations of money laundering and then later trying to cover up the incident. This Thursday, the president finally answered questions about the event in parliament. He has denied being involved in any form of money laundering. 
I deny that there was any form of money laundering. I have said, and, and I've said it more publicly, that it was proceeds of sale of game. Well, France 24's Nadine Theron has more on that investigation from Johannesburg. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa might face an impeachment process soon. An independent panel led by the country's Chief Justice will start investigating the circumstances around an alleged robbery and cover-up of foreign exchange from the President's game farm next week. In 2020, a group of robbers allegedly stole at least $600,000 in cash that was stashed in furniture on the president's farm, but the amount could add up to millions of dollars. According to ex spy boss, boss of Arthur Fraser, Ramaphosa then had the suspects traced in Namibia, kidnapped, interrogated and bribed to keep quiet once the remaining funds had been recovered. But on Thursday, Ramaphosa explicitly denied any involvement in money laundering and stated his willingness to cooperate in all investigations into the incident, and many of them are already underway. But the aim he voted against an ad hoc parliamentary committee probing the incident. This scandal leaves a bad mark on Ramaphosa's clean slate because the president has been known for his determination to root out corruption in South Africa and within the ANC. In Kenya, newly elected President William Ruto has vowed to overhaul the country's income tax regime. The goal is to introduce reforms to ask higher earners to pay more, a way to reduce inequality. In his first speech to Parliament since winning the presidency last month, Ruto said the country was overtaxing trade and undertaxing wealth. The 55-year-old has also promised to clamp down on borrowing in order to kickstart Kenya's economy. The country currently has a $70 billion debt and a third of the population lives in poverty. Now, the World Intellectual Property Organization has released its annual ranking on global innovation. It ranks countries by their capacity for and success in innovation, topping this year's index Switzerland, the United States and Sweden. But there are also some solid performers from Africa. And for more on that, I'm joined by Sasha Wunsch Vincent. He's one of the lead authors of the annual report. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, so your report found that developing that several developing economies were performing above expectation and eight of them are from sub-Saharan Africa. Tell us more. Yeah, thank you, Asim. It's good to be with you. Uh, indeed, today uh, at the UN's World Intellectual Property Organization, we debated the global state of innovation, right? Um, what is going on in 2021 despite of all these crises? And uh, we found innovation to be thriving uh, quite a bit in 2021. Um, mostly, of course, from high-tech companies and also the classic uh, economies that you mentioned, Switzerland, the United States, and Sweden, for example. However, uh, what is more striking is that several developing economies, too, um, are performing way above expectations in 2021, and many of them are from Africa. And can you tell us more about those, uh, those, those countries? What are, what are they doing right? Yeah, so we uh, look at what countries overperform uh, relative to their level of development. And we have eight countries um, in sub-Saharan Africa which fall into this category, uh, with in fact South Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, Mozambique, uh, outperforming for many, many years. And uh, Kenya, Ghana, Namibia, for instance, having moved up uh, relatively strongly um, in, in, in a few years. So it's, a lot of things are happening uh, in Africa. Uh, some of this is not all measured. Uh, many examples uh, are happening in the fintech field, uh, in the health field, uh, but also we've seen a lot of new innovations uh, in everything related to uh, waste treatment or environmental innovations. So help us understand what this innovation index means. If a country is higher up on the list, what does it mean for governing bodies? What does it mean for businesses and, and for people's finances in general? Yes, indeed, um, many countries strive to be up uh, this list because obviously it improves their uh, reputation as a strong innovation performer, which hopefully then also attracts other innovation actors to invest, to set up uh, research and development centers. And overall, uh, let's face it, um, all economies want to be part of global innovation networks. You know, uh, What was really um, 
a very important uh, finding this year is uh, all the venture capital, because you asked me for the reasons, right? What, what happened this year, which was different uh, previously. So all the fresh venture capital that flew uh, into the African region in 2021 was uh, really fresh oxygen uh, to innovation. So we see quadrupled uh, in Africa to about 3 uh, billion US dollars. And all of this is in fields that I just mentioned, fintech, e-commerce platforms, uh, and also some clean tech. So you mentioned how countries strive to be at the top uh, of this report. Are you aware or is this a desired effect for your report to be some sort of a, a virtuous circle that will push countries up and then later the higher up they are, the, the more innovation they will attract? Absolutely so, Wasim. You're absolutely right. That is our goal. And uh, the countries um, that have smelt this beacon, if you like, uh, work uh, in interministerial task forces with all sorts of innovation actors, uh, research institutes, universities, and top firms, and try to see what the elements are that you need to get right to have a proper innovation ecosystem. And then, of course, as first results come in, uh, you know, things improve gradually, and you have some organic innovation ecosystems that are produced. Well, you mentioned those, some of those conditions that, that are required to, 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 to produce a, a good uh, innovation ecosystem. What are some relatively straightforward things that countries can do to encourage that? So, um, look, I think the balance is really between the public and the private sector uh, and to formalize uh, innovation in the corporate sector. Um, so we know that in uh, Africa, uh, innovation is everywhere, right? I mean, um, scarcity is often the mother of innovation. Uh, but uh, sometimes this informal innovation it uh, doesn't really translate into newly high paid jobs and a lot of uh, revenues generated uh, by uh, tax paying firms. So th sometimes the trick is to come up with more formalized um, you know, innovation activities. And often this is about linking uh, all the research that is going on in universities with existing firms and, and then trying to use um, intellectual property, for instance, to protect new ideas uh, to market and commercialize a uh, particular product. So this is uh, what it is all about, but it's an interplay between governments and the, the private sector. All right, Sasha Wunsch, Vincent, an editor of the Global Innovation Index, the annual report that came out just today. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate you coming on to Ion Africa tonight. And that wraps up this edition of, of, Ion, of Ion Africa. Thank you very much for watching. Stay with us here on France 24.